Are you a corporate SKP and wasting valuable time attempting to figure challenges out on your own? Well, this podcast is for you. We bring you firsthand experiences of guests going through many of the struggles you face each and every day. We get real with no corporate BS. And now over to your host, Paul Higgins. Hello and welcome to Corporate Escapees, the podcast that takes you behind the scenes of people who are successfully running their own businesses, hearing their war stories and motivations for making the jump from their corporate gig. I'm your host, Paul Higgins, and our guest today is someone that spent 27 years in corporate, traveling the world and running very successful remote teams. Then the travel and values within the business influenced them to take a redundancy. Now they help business coaches to improve their marketing to get more clients. So what I'll do now is hand you over to Jürgen Strauss from Innova Business. Welcome Jürgen Strauss from Innova Business to the Corporate Escape podcast brought to you by Build Live Give. We're going to get to know lots about you today, Jürgen, but why don't we start with something that your family or friends would know about you that we won't? Thanks. Thanks, Paul. It's great to be here and hopefully I can add value to your audience. Uh, I guess the one thing, I mean, a lot of people do know I'm a, a keen, passionate bike rider, but what my family and friends think is that I'm absolutely obsessive and I go out and do really long rides on weekends, so um, often up to 250 kilometres. So that's probably the one thing that maybe those that know that I am a keen bike rider but are not in my family and friends wouldn't know. Oh, and did you go to the Tour Down Under last week? No, I didn't, not on this occasion, but we're planning to do that as a group next year with, uh, with my bike riding buddies. Uh, excellent, excellent. And uh, have you done the Three Peaks? Because I, I believe you're in Melbourne, Australia. Have you done the Three Peaks? Right? That's right. <laughs> that's a, that's a, an interesting question. I haven't done the Three Peaks. I keep thinking I would like to do that for the challenge and being able to say that I've achieved that challenge, but it, I think it would be beyond enjoyment and even beyond obsession. Yes, yes. Well, I, I did it it's a few years ago now. Um, right. oh, I've got well, a condition I'm... where my uh, I've basically got no hemoglobin. I'm just about to have a transplant. And um, mm. yeah, but back then, yeah, it was a, a joyous occasion when I finished it, but I can tell you it was uh, very hard going. But uh, where, where's your favourite part of Victoria to ride in? Oh, I'd have to say the Alps are my favourite part and I'd love to, I have done bits and pieces of the Three Peaks but not all in one go. Excellent. Great. And um, I know you've had you know, a, a brilliant uh, corporate background before you moved into your own consulting business but why don't you take us through your corporate escapee story? Okay. Well, I had about 27 years in the corporate world in two different companies. The first one was um, out of university was ACFA in the photographic industry and, and I'm a keen photographer as well. So that was kind of, I thought I was living the dream in those early days, but of course it was at the time when digital photography started in the commercial world and the response of ACFA at the time, and of course it was no different at Polaroid or Kodak, was to kind of ignore the development and, and as a young person that was coming into that world and getting exposed to the early things around technology and PCs and so on, I thought that was a really dumb thing to do. So I moved out of that because I saw the writing on the wall for those companies and ended up in another specialty chemical business and spent 23 years touring the world, leading remote teams. Um, I had teams reporting to me from all across Asia and Europe and the US and spent a lot of my time traveling, which was really tough when I had a young family as well. But I really enjoyed the role. It was very service-based, built a lot of great relationships around the world with customers that I still have today. Uh, but at some point, both the travel and changes to the industry and changes to our company that kind of impacted on the culture of it started to rub on me and, and I thought, you know, this isn't a real good fit anymore. And, and with um, one of several rationalizations, I put my hand up for a voluntary redundancy and then decided because my, uh, both my kids were just completing their education at the time, I thought financially it's probably a good time to take a risk and go out and try and do something myself. Excellent. And uh, when you talked about, you know, those uh, – remote teams around the world, what sort of tips have you got for helping 
manage people in different locations because a lot of corporate escapees now have their teams dispersed around the world and I'd love to you know tap into your knowledge in that area yeah I, that there's that could be a couple of podcast episodes <laughs> in and of itself but I guess the key thing is communications and also building a culture having a culture there or you know picking the right people having the right culture in place and then really so with the team I have now it is a remote team as well I'm very precious about making sure that culture is maintained so that everybody's on board, everybody knows the direction of our company, where we're headed, and, of course, they're vested in our success as well. So that that's really key, and communication is a key part of that. Great. And, you know, you talk about having the right direction and vision. What other things do you do to, you know, make the culture uh, great in um, in your business? Well, I'd, I'd go to the lengths of making sure that the vision and the values of the business are public within the business. So we've got um, a website that we have all our processes and systems documented on and the vision and the values are all there as well for people to see. And then making sure that, you know, and it starts with me as the business owner, making sure that the behaviour is always consistent with those values and with that culture. So it comes back to behavior and then providing honest feedback is another good one. And, and the feedback is not around wrapping somebody over the knuckles if they've done something that's not consistent with that culture. It's really about um, providing learning opportunities, but also reinforcing the positive behavior. So it's important to give feedback when somebody's done something well. And at the same time, when things are not the way they should be to give feedback in a way that the person can learn from that rather than, you know, putting them down. Mm, great. And, uh, and you, as you said, you know, uh, 27 years in corporate is a long time. When you yep. first made the transition in your own business, you know, was it easier or harder than you expected? <laughs> it was a lot harder than I expected. So I, um, I thought, well, I've got, all this experience in various different areas and I had a look around what was happening in local small business and I thought man they need help in in all of these areas but the problem was they didn't think they needed help in those areas and that of course coincided at the time with the global financial crisis when their primary focus was tightening their belts and making sure that they survived the global financial crisis and didn't overextend themselves with money that they spent. So when I came in and said, hey, you need to be doing this and you need to be doing that and I can help you, they said, well, you know, we're tightening the belt. We don't want to spend money on that. We don't really see the need to be doing those things. And, and what happened? How did you work your way through that? Well, it was kind of a bit serendipitous because what I um, wanted to help with was building marketing systems for small business. So helping them realize that marketing is actually a service that is, and it's part of their service and that they can build a system whereby it, it's done in a way that delivers consistent results. And I found it very hard to get that message across initially. What I found was in those days, most small businesses didn't have websites. So I heard um, some feedback, but if you can do a website for me, that we really need that right now. Now, they didn't know why they needed a website. It was really just that everybody else is starting to do websites and I don't have one. So the third time I heard that, I am a slow learner. So it took me three goes to hear that before I responded. And the third time I said, well, I can do a website for you. Now, I didn't just say that off the bat because I was involved way back in 1997 with doing a big corporate website and um, building the strategy around that, building a whole marketing strategy and SEO keywords with Yahoo at the time because that was before Google. Um, so I knew all the things that needed to be done. What I didn't know, of course, was the nitty gritty hands-on IT stuff because in the corporate world, you've got an IT department and you've got a graphic design department to do all those things. So I, I took the plunge and said, yes, I can do that for you. And I went away and thought, well, I better find out how to do all the nitty gritty bits that I don't know right now. But then um, we built that website using the fundamental strategy components that I was familiar with and got immediate results out of that, picked up a few other website 
businesses. And so we started building websites and using the marketing systems to make them actually work rather than just be an online brochure, which was what people were doing in those days more than anything else. Great. And just before we go to your current business now, um, what sort of help did you get along the way uh, through your journey of transition? Well, I had um, very early on, I um, met a wonderful business coach who's still my business coach now. And that has proved absolutely invaluable. I mean, without her help, um, you know, I probably would have just been floundering around. Um, I also joined a community called WP Elevation, got involved with them, and they did some training. In the very early days, I actually um, you know, got involved when they were starting up and helped them evolve their training. Um, I was part of a group that gave a lot of feedback and asked a lot of questions around, you know, why don't you do this? Or, you know, it'd be really helpful to have this for my business. So they built on that. And as a result, I became actually a mentor for their community and still am a mentor for that community, but still derive a huge amount of learning from the team there. Um, And I also got involved about 18 months ago with Seth Godin's um, this is Marketing Mastermind, which has been an amazing journey as well. So they're, they're probably the highlights. I'm sure there's a lot more. Great. And just uh, quickly for li- people listening, uh, WP Elevation, what, what do they actually do? WP Elevation is a community for WordPress consultants. Um, and it really teaches WordPress consultants how to run a business based on WordPress. That's, that's really it in a nutshell. Great. Excellent. Well, uh, the next section is into the build section. So when someone asks, Jürgen, what do you do for a living today? How do you answer that? Yeah, well, what, what we do today is that we partner with, and that's important, that we partner with innovative, exceptional business coaches and consultants. And our primary focus is the ones that kind of operate in the technical and manufacturing sector, because that's where my background is. And we enable them to acquire more leads and more business. Great. And uh, I suppose the question is, how do you go about that? (laughs) Yeah, that's right. Um, Well, we help them reach their their ideal customers, their ideal audience with their message so that they'll achieve growth and be able to make a difference to more of those ideal clients. And, you know, what do you know about driving leads for these type of businesses that many don't? Well, I guess we take a, a, a novel approach to marketing in that, first of all, with my science background, it's very systematic and everything is measured. So we then take what we learn from the measurements and adapt and adjust on the way. And we, you know, we run lots of experiments and try out different things. So whilst it's very systematic, it's not rigid in the sense of here's, here's a funnel that works for everybody and we're going to force fit you into that funnel. Um, one of the things that Uh, we do that is I guess different in a way is that my view on marketing is very much that marketing is around a service orientation and it's not just um, in the pre-sales cycle if you like so marketing is really at the core of your business it starts with understanding your target market and it goes all the way to delivering an exceptional experience once somebody's actually um, paid you for a service and then making sure that you build on that relationship that you have when the person is a customer so that you can identify other problems that they have or other issues that they have and address those that you have an expertise in. Great. And, and what and what are some of the key tips you see on, um, I suppose, post-sale? So more that customer service after someone's bought for you, what are the key things that you see working at the moment? Well, there's probably three or four things that I kind of recommend and and this isn't exhaustive, but when somebody first purchases and says, okay, I'm in, I'm, you've convinced me, um, I'm going in. So then making sure that you start that experience on the right foot and, you know, there's the thing known as buyer's remorse. So you want to tackle that straight up front and immediately they've made that decision, come back and say, well, here's what you can expect from us. Here's what we're going to do. Here's how we're going to do it. And really get 
build the momentum right from the get-go. And, and if it's a case of, you know, we're going to get started in two weeks' time with the project, but in that two weeks, make sure that you're feeding information and getting them primed so to really kick off the project when the time comes in a really positive way. So that's probably the first one. Um, the second one is is really making sure that you express your gratitude and that. And I'll probably mention... Um, some tools later on when we talk about that, but there's ways where you can use tools and technology to get in front of the customer with messages that express your gratitude and appreciation for going ahead and for their trust in you, but also giving them some further information in terms of, you know, while we're waiting to get started, here's some of the things you might want to read or you might consider getting started with. And then the third one really is helping them, really taking time to understand what else can you help them with? And then, you know, looking at opportunities to help them with that. And it's all around, you know, making sure that you're building a partnership and demonstrate that you're committed to helping them grow their business if that's their objective. Excellent. And uh, you talked about, you know, tech and manufacturing businesses, but just tell us a little bit more about your ideal client and how you arrived at that. Okay, well, in, in a way, this has evolved over many years, but you know, I've got a very clear um, definition of my ideal client to the point where I have a photograph and she has a name, so she's Coach Sam. She's an enthusiastic and motivated business coach in her mid-40s. She's passionate about working with small and medium-sized businesses. Typically, she'll have a team of five to 20 people. Um, she's got a servant's heart, so the culture fit to me is, is very important. Um, she's well re- known and respected in her community. She's a problem solver and she's the go-to person for her particular field. Um, she spends a lot of time online. She follows and models other international coaches and entrepreneurs. And her biggest challenge is time to work on marketing and marketing systems. Uh, she kind of thinks big picture and she often struggles with delving into details and you know, being systematic around things like marketing that aren't her core strength. Great. And you mentioned she, is that your key focus or you also cater for all genders? I cater for all genders. It's just that I, um, and I picked the name Sam so that it's uh, it's ambiguous if I don't <laughs> use, use the uh, gender based article. Uh, but the description and the photograph I have is of a, a woman. So, and, and the photograph for me is just the memory jogger. So I can see the picture in my mind and that brings up all the information I have about her. And, and of course, that information, like I've got pages of information um, written down and any time I learn something new about one of the clients I work with who fits that ideal client profile, I, I add that to my description. Excellent. And uh, for your business, you know, um, in Overbiz, what will it look like in three years' time? Mm, that's a great question. So I, um, there's a few uh, interesting things going on. We're looking to transition a lot more to doing online training products and online training resources. And one of the big reasons for that is just getting leverage because at, at the moment there's still a big element of time for money. Um, so investing one-on-one work. So that we want to put up a lot of online training resources that is going to be work done once and it's there for many people to benefit from. Uh, the other thing I'm doing, and I have, I've done two of these now with, um, with my business coach and another business as well, is an annual business summit where we take a small group of business owners away into the tropics somewhere for a week and we work on their plans to generate a $1 million growth in their business or, you know, if they're already a $1 million business, then we look to grow it to $10 million. Um, and that's June of every year and we're thinking about Fiji this year. So that's, uh, you know, a small retreat thing that we do and we, we take a very unique approach to that whole week and it's been awesome to see what's transpired for the businesses that came on the first two ones of those. And then, of course, I have... My podcast, the Innova Buzz podcast, where I've interviewed innovators from all around the world, which is awesome. I mean, every 
every episode gives me an hour's masterclass on something or other. And, and so, of course, I pick things that are of interest to me, but also to my audience. So I want to keep building on that. And there's so much content there. I'm thinking of what can I do with that content? It might be a book or it might be something else. I'm not sure about that one yet, but I'm about to start another podcast called Tales of Marketing Transformation. So we're doing a lot in the podcasting space and starting to help people build their podcasts as well. Great. And uh, I know you said at the start that you've you know done uh, over 100 episodes now. Uh, for someone that's just looking to start a podcast, what are some tips you've got for them for starting? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So first of all, get really clear about who your audience is. Uh, which is, you know, I talked about target market before for marketing. That's the same in podcasting. Get really clear about who the audience is and then what what's your message and what's unique about your message that would have somebody listen to it. So they're the two things to be really clear about. In terms of the mechanics of getting started, um, it's not, it doesn't need to be as hard as a lot of people make out. So if you have a PC or a Mac, um, in fact, if you have a smartphone and a microphone, which smartphones have built in, then you can use various platforms to start up podcast recordings. And, you know, there's lots of information online as to how to then set it up so that it goes to uh, iTunes, which now is Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts. And you can go on to Stitcher for the Android platform and there's other platforms to go on like Spotify um, the music app, you can do uh, put the podcast there. So these are just areas where they're found, where people can then go and listen to them. But it's not really difficult to get started. So my suggestion would be if somebody's really keen to do it, just jump in and get started and then improve it as you go. You know, of course, you can set up a, a professional quality microphone. You can get professional quality editing. You can get a heap of things done, but don't let that be a barrier to getting started. You know, work your way into that later on. Yeah, I think that's great advice. And uh, certainly we've, you know, I've got connections at all different levels that can help with podcasting. So uh, if you're listening now and you want to start and build simple as per, per Jürgen's advice, um, certainly reach out to us here at Build Live Give and we can, uh, can help you. And um, around the profitability of, of your business, Jürgen, what have you done to improve the profitability of your business? The first focus, of course, is growth, growth in revenue. Um, I was about to jump in and say controlling costs and so on, but that, that is definitely a part of it. But the first thing to focus on really is growing revenue. And we have, I mentioned the um, business retreat with the way we operate the plans on that as we kind of set up the year in seasons like the um, weather seasons and autumn is the harvest season and so that's when there's a lot of revenue coming in there's a lot of activities that are related to uh, delivering services that generate revenue and then the winter is where the revenue might be a little quieter so we do a lot of the planning there so you know, we, we structure it in that way and that gives us also the ability to look at our cash flow and expenditure in the same cycle so that we're not in positions where cash flow might be stretched in, let's say, the winter time where there's not a lot of incoming um, revenue. So first thing really just around revenue and then uh, growth of new business and looking at the business in terms of seasons so you match up where the expenditure and the income is going to be. Okay, excellent. And what's the number one source of new business for you? The number one source is probably referrals. Um, although I do get quite a few coming through the podcast in directly and indirectly, um, but it's generally, you know, I classify some of that as referral business anyway if I've met the person through some means and then they either become a client or, or refer somebody else. Great. And uh, anything you do specifically to drive more referrals? Um, yeah, we have, we have part of our marketing system, in fact, is, is growing or orchestrating and stimulating referrals. So we have a system where we get people to give us referrals um, 
basically we ask for it, but you know, there's a kind of process to go through. So you've got to give them an incentive to provide you a referral. And I don't mean a money incentive or anything like that. It's really just using the relationships that you have and helping to get referrals with that. And I know a lot of people are really nervous to ask for referrals. They have it on their list to do, but they seem to always avoid it. What What are some tips you've got on well, so, not yeah. avoiding it? I, one of the podcast guests I spoke to a little while ago said something about aim for the no. Um, so don't worry about being rejected because what's the worst that can happen? Somebody will say no. Um, and his advice was aim for no, and he would rejoice when he got a no because then he, he and he had some number like five or something in the day that he'd asked for, and when he got to the five no's, then he was happy. So the, he'd, if he got the first no, he'd go and ask another question because he knew he had to go for five no's, and of course, if he got a yes in between, he'd have to ask another question. So I thought that was a, a novel way of approaching it. But the key thing is if somebody says no, it's not the end of the world, so don't take it personally. Um, it's as simple, really, as um, if if somebody says, oh, look, oh, that was awesome. You did a wonderful job on X, Y, Z. Then responding with, well, I'm really glad that it helped you. And do you know of anybody else that needs help with X, Y, and Z? Okay, great. And um, you spoke before that you got a remote team. Just tell us a little bit about who's in that team and what they do for you. Okay, so um, I've got actually one employee who's my executive assistant and she manages my entire podcasting um, process. So I I just turn up on the day. Um, I do a little bit of research, obviously, about the guests that I'm going to have on board. I turn up on the day, interview them, um, save the recording and she does the rest of it. So she's awesome like that. She does a whole lot of other stuff related to keeping me on track and making sure that I'm working on the right things. Um, And then I have a bunch of people that are sort of like contractors or strategic partners that do various things from bookkeeping to some writing to building websites for us. Um, But I consider them all part of the team, even though they're not employees. Great. Excellent. And uh, just quickly, how did you go about finding the right people to work with? Yeah, that's a great question. So, with my executive assistant and, and she works out of an office in the Philippines. So I rent some space there and they actually provide some assistance with um, hiring. Uh, but I'm kind of well known there because the interviewing that we do when we hire people there. And I've had um, one person a little while ago who left because she moved to the U S and the time zone wasn't going to work for me anymore. So we replaced her, but the, um, Each time we seem to get awesome people because of the way we carry out that hiring. And it's all in the interviewing, the interviewing. So we, you know, you hear people say hire for attitude, not for skills. And of course, the key thing is the person has to have the skill to do the job. So we do check that. But what we do is look at in the interview um, behaviors and we look at historical things. So we actually, get them to tell us about a scenario where they were challenged by something or a scenario where they had a great success and how did they celebrate that? A scenario where, you know, they had a great failure and how did they deal with that and how did they recover from that? So we look at all those things and really understand how does this person behave in different situations? And if you do that well, then it actually gives you a good predictor for how they might respond in you know, the situations that they'll find themselves in, in your company. Well, before we go into the next section, I'd like to mention our YouTube channel called Build, Live, Give. You get great tips to help corporate escapees, just like Jürgen, to rapidly grow. So please go and look at the great tips, subscribe if you love it, and also share it with other corporate escapees so we can help them get both lifestyle and financial freedom. So Jürgen, the next is your daily habits what are the key daily habits that make you successful okay well i mentioned at the beginning that i'm an obsessive bike rider so the first thing i do in the morning i get up at about 5 15 every morning and i hop on my bike go for about an hour or so morning bike ride Um, usually with a bunch of buddies so we go together and some of them are pretty competitive and then we have a coffee afterwards just to kind of 
be very social to the fat. Usually we talk a lot of biking nonsense. Um, but uh, then I come back home, shower and check in with the team to see what's happening, make sure everybody's happy online. You know, it's sort of the, the good morning thing. It's kind of the coffee chat. If you're in the same office, you'd come in and say hello and how are things going? What was your weekend like for on a Monday morning? So we do all of that in a virtual sense. Um, I usually sit down and do some writing at that point. Um, I've taken to journaling over the last few months um, and I'm finding that really helpful in terms of generating um, new stories that I use for marketing and new ideas um, and I'm working through that. So often I'll sit down for 10 or 15 minutes and do that. Um, I tend to listen to a lot of podcasts throughout the day. So typically after lunch or over lunch and after lunch, I'll uh, listen to podcasts or I might read a book. Um, I listen to audio books as well. So that, that's really important. I, I love to discover new things and learn new things. Um, it really keeps me going as well. Great. And um I know your wife, Gertie, is going to listen to this podcast. What would you like to say to her about the support she's given you through this transition? Well, it's, it's really invaluable to have a partner that supports you in, in this quest because having, I mean, she took, she basically put her career on hold to stay home and raise our children. And that was really important to us that one parent was at home with our children at the time. So she did that. And then when the children went to university and left home. She was looking around for other things to do. So she started a career in childcare. But at the same time, you know, her support in allowing me the freedom to do what I do and still go out and do all my bike riding as well has, um, is absolutely critical. And, you know, without that, I couldn't be where I am today. Great. And uh, I know that uh, you talked uh, earlier uh, pre-interview around children and uh, travel, um, but just what are some of the things you've been able to do with your children that you wouldn't have maybe able to do if you're still in corporate? Mm. So my son lives in San Francisco um, and this year we spent six weeks in San Francisco uh, visiting him and having a holiday. and. Whilst it was a holiday, I still did a little bit of work. So we we stored up about 10 episodes of the podcast. So I made sure they were being published regularly, although I had very little to do with it after I'd recorded them. So being in your own business and having things set up in a systematic way and having a team to take care of the day-to-day -day running of it allows you to do things like that. And of course, being able to spend time with my son, who's uh, you know, around the other side of the world was really, you know, just precious for me. And my daughter, she's close by. She lives in Melbourne, but she's also a very keen bike rider. So she and I often take off for a weekend and we'll t make a long weekend of it um, up into the mountains, we were talking earlier, and spend three or four days cycling together. So, you know, doing things like that um, would be so much harder in the corporate world. Mm, so true. And uh, look, the next section is the give section. So what's a cause or a community you're passionate about and why? Yeah. So there's two, two that I'm really passionate about. One is the Fiona Elsie Cancer Research Institute and the other one is the Children's Medical Research Institute. Now, both of those are cancer research um, institutes and they, I came across them. Well, why I'm passionate about that, my mum who passed away five years ago, she um, suffered all through her life with various forms of cancer. And, you know, I think, and, and both of those charities work with cancer research, particularly for young people. And I think, you know, this is such an insidious disease that I don't think anyone should have to suffer, but particularly young people and children. So I came across these research institutes because they do riding challenges. So it kind of intersected with my bike riding. Um, so I do quite a few riding challenges where we fundraise, we do some extreme riding um, and get people to help us, help sponsor us, and then we fundraise for those causes. And they do some amazing work. Brilliant. Well, uh, the last section is the action section where I ask you some questions and get some rapid fire responses. So the first one is what's your top three productivity tips? So the first one I think is be clear why you're doing what you're doing and what the outcome 
would be from that. So be really clear of the outcome, have the end in mind and why you're doing that. The second one is to set quarterly themes and weekly targets. So keep you on track there. And then the third one would be focus. And, you know, most of us try to do a whole heap of things and I suffer from that as well. But I think the key thing is pick one thing each day to focus on and then use lists to keep you focused on that. Great. And what are some of your favorite apps or software that you use to run your business? Well, the first one is Slack. I have to use Slack. So that, that's what we use to communicate with the remote team members. So I'm on Slack all the time. The second one is Notion. I'm not sure you know that one, notion.so. So we use that now for storing all of our systems and processes and for the podcast notes and uh, basically building our learning systems. And then I'll give two, I'll give mention to two video apps. The first one is Loom. So Loom is an app where you can very quickly record either a video to camera using your, your computer or you can do a screen recording. So it's invaluable for both the team to give instructional feedback and also for customers. And I've used it a lot for giving feedback to uh, suppliers of software if there's an issue we're having with the software I'll do a screen recording and video and send it back to them and that they find that incredibly helpful compared to just an email and the other one is Bonjoro we talked earlier about um, and I know you've had Matt on the podcast from Bonjoro so you probably know it pretty well and those that have listened to the podcast but the we talked earlier about the customer experience and Bonjoro is a video app where you can quickly send a video message from your phone wherever you are and we use that a lot just to kind of stand out from everybody else that might send emails or might even not communicate at all so we send a quick video and say how are you doing just wanted to check in um, I use it to thank people on the pod after they've been on the podcast so Everybody gets a, a unique video back, so we do something quite unique with it. Great, and uh, we'll definitely have the links to uh, Matt's great uh, podcast, as you mentioned in the show notes, plus everything else that you've mentioned here, Jürgen. And uh, the next question is, uh, speaking of podcasts, your favourite podcasts you would recommend to listen to, given you uh, listen daily? Yeah. So I listen to a lot of the popular podcasts, but I'll mention some that perhaps aren't quite as well known. Uh, the Local Business Leaders podcast by Phil Singleton is absolutely awesome. And that guy's got so many fabulous ideas. He's just a fountain of ideas. Uh, the podcast Talent Coach by Eric K. Johnson is a really good one. Um, good one for podcasters to listen to. So I listen to that a lot. Uh, the Marketing Book, the Marketing Book podcast is great by Douglas Burdett. He takes a book each week and he basically dissects it and often he interviews the author. And the other one is All Selling Aside by Alex Mandosian. Brilliant. So we will have all the links to those great podcasts that you mentioned there. Um, I must admit, I haven't heard of any of those, so I can't wait to add them to my, uh, to my list. So um, Jürgen, you know, you've uh, given some brilliant advice over today's show, but what's some parting advice you'd love to leave fellow corporate escapees? I think the parting advice I'd give everyone is get really clear about who your ideal client is or if, you know, if you're presenting who's your ideal audience and be exceptionally valuable to them. Brilliant. Uh, clear and practical. I love it. So, uh, look, you can find out more about Jürgen and the great work he does at uh, I N double N O V A biz dot co forward slash M A S. And he's got uh, six questions. Is that right? That's Jürgen, right. Yeah. That people can, uh, can so find it's a, out. It's a marketing health check where we ask six questions and we'll come back and give you some advice. Three, three things that you can do very quickly, very actionable, short things that you can do that will make a big difference to your marketing. Brian, and we'll also have uh, Jürgen's LinkedIn profile there as well where you can find out more about him. So um, once again, Jürgen, uh, brilliant having you on and thanks for coming on and sharing your wisdom with the Corporate Escapee community. Thanks for having me on, Paul, and, and I really appreciate you doing this podcast. I know when I first 
left the corporate world and went into my own business, it would have been so invaluable to have a resource like this. So keep doing the wonderful work you're doing. Great. Thanks, Jürgen. Bye. Bye. I really enjoyed this interview with Jürgen. And to me, there were sort of three key things that I took out of it. One was nailing your ideal client. I think he did a brilliant job of articulating his ideal client. If you aren't there, really get into it. And I've also got a great template if you want one. So uh, just reach out to me. The second is the power of experiments in marketing. So he takes a very measured approach and I really loved how he uses experiments to get it right. You know, yes, gut feeling is important, but it's really important to get the feedback from clients. And the third thing is making your culture and values public and holding people accountable accountable to them. I love it. So you might have dispersed people around the world that aren't technically your employees, but actually making sure that they live your your culture and your values is really important. So I'd love to hear what you got out of this. Email me at paul at buildlivegive.com to tell me what you got out of it. Also love for you to share this episode with other corporate escapees so we can find both lifestyle and financial freedom. Thank you for listening to the Corporate Escapees podcast brought to you by Build Live Give. If you would like to join a community of like-minded peers, please visit www.buildlivegive.com. Until next time, thanks for listening and be brave.